Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's six o'clock, uh, and I'm uh, very happy to welcome you to the discussion that follows the um, wonderful lecture that you that I know so far 74 people um, have seen pre-recorded and, and watched on our YouTube channel, which is a, a far preferable platform uh, in, in terms of uh, clarity of both images and audio uh, to consume um, the videos. And I'm uh, urging you to go and look at all of the videos on our site in this series, uh, Rewriting Skyscraper History. Before I introduce uh, Joanna and uh, also Tom Leslie, or reintroduce him because you've now seen him a, a few times in this series, and we're delighted that he could join us for a, a conversation about uh, labor. Uh, you may have, if you came early into the room uh, at five o'clock, seen an excerpt of the talk that he gave back in September on uh, masonry to metal or and material matters where um, he looked at the role uh, at the end of the talk about um, of the, the role of, of bricklayers uh, and their um, organization uh, to uh, affect legislation, their threats of strikes, uh, and the continuous movement from masonry to metal uh, that reflected an urge uh, a desire to industrialize and to uh, remove labor as much as possible from the equation of skyscraper building. Um, and that is very much uh, a, a, a central uh, focus of Joanna's talk. Uh, and uh, I thought it would be interesting to bring Tom back into the discussion in both in order to compare research methods, um, most specifically on Chicago, uh, where um, both Joanna and Tom have spent a, an enormous amount of their research lives um, going through the material of the late 19th century. And I'll, I'll show you the covers of, of their books um, in, in a few minutes minutes in order to get into that historiography. Uh, but I thought, in addition, the questions of how they did their research, the kinds of materials uh, where, um, to, to search in order to find a kind of some um, fundamental sources that may not have been probed so much by uh, uh, earlier scholars or that still need to be exposed in new research. So we wanna have um, at least a two-part um, aspect to this discussion, looking at research strategies uh, and places to look research questions, uh, as well as on the specific subject of labor and um, capital and skyscraper construction. Rewriting skyscraper history, looking back from the 21st century, well, we're all here in the 21st century, um, and part of this idea of the perspective of looking back from our, our, our current moment uh, is part of a unspoken lecture that I hope that I'll give um, sometime in December that'll summarize some of the initial thoughts that um, instigated uh, this uh, particular series, um, and also incorporates some of the um, uh, lessons learned or the facts um, uh, that knocked on my head by the current exhibition. Well, when the Skyscraper Museum opens again, we'll have uh, the show called Super Tall 2020, uh, which looks at the uh, the 21st century, principally, of the super tall building. Uh, and the key characteristic of 21st century super talls is the use of concrete rather than the use of steel. All the other issues about labor um, have their uh, echoes in the 21st century uh, of gender, of certainly economics, of capital. Uh, globalism becomes uh, certainly a, a new theme. But if we look back from today at the 19th century, as we are doing in this, um, in this series, uh, we, uh, for tonight, are taking the topic tall buildings labor and capital. And uh, Joanna Merwood Salisbury, uh, our speaker, uh, is a person, and uh, let me just finish with this slide and this page first, because we're uh, showing you both an image of Chicago and of New York, uh, of Union Square in New York, because the kind of labor that she explores in her talk uh, 
uh, for those of you who haven't heard it yet, is both um, construction labor, but also the labor movement, uh, the labor protests, labor strikes, but also labor organization as in Union Square in New York. Now, her um, two books that pertain directly to these topics are Chicago 1890 uh, and uh, that book was evolved from her research uh, and for her dissertation at the at Princeton University. Uh, she did her PhD at Princeton. She did her master's in architecture at McGill uh, and uh, uh, also uh, a bachelor's of architecture previously in New Zealand. Ah, and I failed to, um, to mention that she's joining us to, uh, tonight from Wellington, New Zealand. So this is a wonderful example of some of a, a situation where Zoom really enables our, our, our global reach. Um, but I have to thank Joanna for previous lectures that she's in fact given at the Skyscraper Museum. And some of those are on our website so that you can go back and um, hear her talk about her book, Chicago 1890 from a talk that she gave um, probably a decade or so ago. Now her work on New York, in particular on Union Square uh, in the other uh, image that you see here of the cover of the book, Designing for the Crowd, uh, Patriotism and Protest in Union Square, uh, found its um, center in close proximity to her, the place that she was teaching at that moment, which is Parsons School of Design on 14th Street. Uh, so that research uh, was um, a number of years in the making for this book, which uh, she also spoke about at the Skyscraper Museum. And you can hear her lecture on our website uh, in order to fill out another 45 minutes or so of rich detail of the, um, the design of Union Square, its urban planning, but also its place in skyscraper history and in um, labor history. Uh, and uh, there it is, Union Square, looking south um, during the first Labor Day parade in one of the images that she, she showed um, in her lecture tonight. Um, so Tom Leslie, uh, those of you probably have seen him a number of times before in his two lectures in this series, uh, know of his book, Chicago Skyscrapers, 1871-1934, and he's now at work uh, on the sequel, which is going to take us uh, up to uh, 1986, I think I, I read. I'm not sure. I guess a third, third book is on the way after that, Tom. Um, you'll have to tell us more <laughs> okay, about that research. Um, but in any case, um, you know Tom as a professor from the from uh, Iowa State University, and he's um, joining us from Ames, Iowa tonight. So, um, his talk, Masonry uh, to Steel, in the series where there was a. a a pair of talks by Tom and, and Don Friedman. And I show you Don Friedman's book here too, um, just out, if not almost out, The Structure of Skyscrapers in America. Again, the same um, period of, of the late 19th century, the last decades of the 19th century that we're focusing on in this semester's series. Um, and in the title of Don's book is this lens of structure, which is one of the ones um, that we have already explored and that we'll continue to talk about um, tonight. Uh, of course, the, the Dean of uh, the history of the skyscraper in Chicago, uh, there is an immense amount of scholarship on Chicago as there is in New York, but Chicago somehow is the, um, the hometown of architecture um, with its broad shoulders uh, enabled by steel. Um, it, it takes um, as such a great part of its identity, its relationship to the skyscraper. Much of that scholarship in the era of Condit is focused around these questions of technology um, and, um, and, and structural um, uh, invention uh, and technological invention. Uh, we're gonna talk about some other lenses of history tonight. Uh, history of technology is one that we've already uh, concentrated quite a bit of time on in this uh, semester. Architectural history, obviously um, I'm an architectural historian. This is a kind of principal lens for me. Uh, Donald Friedman has talked about how the lens of architectural history always seem, always privileges the building itself. So that's something to think about, especially when kind of the next um, broader universe in which to examine these buildings, urban history, uh, is a topic that brings in 
um, ac across many disciplines, whether it's uh, geography or American history uh, or landscape or environmental su studies. Um, urban history, uh, it connects to, to many disciplines um, of history and other disciplines. Environmental systems, I think um, Tom Leslie can speak a little bit to, um, to this because it seems to be the approach um, that he pursued uh, in, in much of his work, but certainly in the talk that he gave on the grain elevators of Chicago. Uh, and also is in the lineage um, of the wonderful uh, uh, history of Chicago by William Cronin, Nature's Metropolis. Uh, and then of course, social and economic history. There are also gender studies. There are, there are many um, slices at this history that we, uh, we could and, and will discuss. Um, I myself have, have focused on what I would call both the architectural and urban history of Chicago. And I'll talk about this another time. Uh, and it's something uh, that is at the center of uh, the, the place where I, st I started Skyscraper, well, the Skyscraper History and, and the Skyscraper Museum back um, when I was writing Form Follows Finance and looked at um, a, a contrast between the skylines, the buildings and the skylines of New York and Chicago. And we're seeing Chicago there and we're seeing New York, um, the city of towers here um, in this postcard view of a later, peri uh, later period. But other questions, what are the other questions um, that we want to look at? And we're going to discuss that in our dialogue tonight. Let me ask Joanna to begin by um, perhaps um, a, a very brief summary of, uh, you know, about the topic of your talk, why you selected it um, and how it fits into your, your, your broad research. Sure, Tato. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, it's really great to be part of this series, and I thank you for the invitation to, um, to participate. When, um, when you asked me, would you like to be part of the Rewriting the Skyscraper Symposium, I thought, yes, of course, all my um, great friends and, and um, people I respect are there, so I can't miss it. Um, but what can I bring um, that perhaps others might not be bringing? Um, so I, I was really inspired actually by my most recent book, the one that you mentioned, Design for the Crowd, which is on Union Square um, in New York City. And that book is not about skyscrapers, although skyscrapers are involved. It's about um, urban space and the, the meaning of public space um, in 19th and 20th century America. Um, and sort of reflecting on the trajectory of my work, as you mentioned, I started off talking about the Chicago skyscraper and then moved to New York, I, I realized the thing that connected those two projects was this question of labor or rather the kind of human side of skyscraper design. We were talking a little bit um, before the session began about um, lenses of skyscraper history. Uh, and it's certainly true, I think, that architectural historians are still kind of digging themselves out from under the influence of art history in that we tend to very much privilege the architect as the author or the creator of a building, um, which may have some legitimacy when you're talking about something relatively small. But when you get to something as big as a large commercial building, obviously there are many, many people involved. Um, and my... Um, instinct was to say, how can I talk about this larger body of what we might call actors involved in the creation of the skyscraper, not just people we know about, uh, Burnham, Sullivan, um, George Post, people like that, but also the contractors, the laborers, and also people who worked in the buildings when they were built, uh, new kinds of workers. Um, and the way people responded to this new skyscraper city that they were seeing created around them. So rather than just a few figures looking at groups of figures. And for me, that's a valuable approach because it allows us to talk about a very wide demographic of people in, in the urban industrial centers in late 19th century America, not just um, well-educated white men who were you know, leading the profession, but also um, a very wide diversity of ethnicities, people involved in the various building trades, 
um, the entry of women into the world of work, both uh, in clerical work and in manufacturing, and also um, a kind of appearance of an alternative voice about what the skyscraper meant. And that's why I spent a little bit of time in my presentation talking about um, radical resistance to the skyscraper on the part of people like Lucy Parsons and others. Um, because I think those voices uh, are very well known in other kinds of history, other, other kinds of American history and urban history, but not very well known in architectural history. Um, they, I think, are useful to look at because they suggest that our kind of canonical uh, construction of the skyscraper is something that really symbolizes progress um, and is uh, something to be celebrated as a kind of national symbol um, of, of achievement uh, was at its origins, and perhaps now too, we can talk about that, um, not necessarily seen as universally a positive thing, that it was perhaps um, considered a symbol of, a, of an economic and social and political system that was inequitable, that needed to be changed, either through a kind of slow evolutionary process of political change or through even a radical process of revolution for some people. Um, so unpacking the kind of narrative of the skyscraper architect as its sole author was one of my motivations. And the other motivation is to undo um, a sort of linear history of the skyscraper in which it's the sort of pinnacle of modern American achievement, trying to understand its, its more broader interpretations. Uh, Tom, why don't you uh, chime in on what, whatever ideas that provokes uh, to you uh, and maybe talk also about your own, own work and, and the particular aspirations for it. Sure. I, well, I, I, I like the way Joanna explained her, her background and her stance uh, quite a bit. I, I remember reading Chicago 1890 for the first time while I was working on my own uh, book. And, you know, at first panicking because anytime <laughs> someone writes on, you know, exactly your topic, uh, you get a little worried. Um, but finding that actually uh, the way that we approach things, we, we both came from a, a place of wanting, I think, to, to take down some of the mythology and, and certainly to get past the kind of art historical narratives of, you know, objects and styles and you know, biographies of great white men. Uh, and, and to look at the skyscraper much more as the resultant of lots of different forces, uh, economic, artistic, cultural, certainly, but also uh, you know, social, uh, labor history, industrial history, environmental history. To, in, in my case, to see just how broadly uh, you, you know, a, a, a group of disciplines that the skyscraper uh, could, could touch. And, and you know, it turns out to be at the center of, of dozens of, of potential narratives. Um, I think that you know, to, to maybe distinguish what I do just, just a little bit. Um, I, I wanna put the architect back, not on a pedestal, but as the kind of orchestrator uh, and, and to acknowledge that, you know, there, there were real differences between a, a Burnham building and a Jenny building or, you know, a Sullivan building and a Halliburton and Roche building. Um, but they had to do more with uh, the, the ways that individual firms treated this kind of vast array of, of resources they had and, and the kind of single-minded uh, program that the commercial skyscrapers of, of the time had. And that, I think, comes from my own background in practice, um, not trained as an historian, but uh, licensed as an architect and, and kind of used to that feeling at the drawing table where you know what you have to do, you know the kind of, you know, what's available to do it, and you're constantly paying attention to uh, you know, the, 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 the water content and concrete, uh, but also, you know, the kind of uh, finish on aluminum mullion, uh, getting phone calls about, you know, labor shortages or, uh, you know, just the, the phone call can come from absolutely anywhere and be about anything. And so I, I very much always want to bring that uh, to my work and, and to point out that, you know, there is someone there who's, who's trying desperately to orchestrate all of this. Um, and that as we're looking at the kind of broad array of forces, 
and the skyscraper is a kind of evolutionary thing, but it's not a, an anonymous thing. It's certainly not a vernacular thing that um, it is this unique intersection between uh, you know, broad global national forces and occasionally you know, very, very strong economic desires on the part of the client, but legitimate uh, aesthetic desires on, on the part of the architects uh, as, as well. Mm -hmm. Um, well, that makes me think, Joanna, about the, um, speaking of or orchestrating, uh, a profession that's, that's left out of your formulation, and that is the, the, the role of the builder or the general contractor, which begins to emerge in the 1890s in Chicago in particular, I think. Um, of course, there were builders earlier than that. So I have, I have a two-part question for you uh, to expand on, on your talk. Can you, can, in the... Uh, can you paint um, a, a somewhat more detailed picture of labor as, as the laborers within their individual building trades um, and tell us something a little bit about mm, the, um, the daily wage uh, at the, in the period that you're looking at in the, in the 1880s, um, the kind of uh, ethnicity formulations of the different trades. Um, and then juxtapose those. Um, so rather than seeing them as a group, as labor, to see them as laborers um, and tell us, you know, how do you get at that material? Um, how do you learn what the, uh, what the daily wage is when someone's striking, maybe hear about it in the newspaper, but what other kinds of records are there that we can probe? Um, and then, then um, to my mind, the, this kind of missing piece about how does uh, the orchestrator of a skyscraper who becomes the builder, and I know this from uh, Starrett Brothers and Eakin who built the Empire State Building and we, uh, we the Skyscraper Museum received this great document um, of which there are so, so very, very few, a, a notebook that was their um, really kind of private record, but the museum did publish it as building the Empire State, which was the daily job diary that, that um, summarized for a single day, um, the number of workers, 3,400 that were on the site by their trades, how much were, how many people were in, uh, how many riveters were employed that day, the number in the riveting gangs. Um, and that kind of documentation altogether, which the Stare Brothers put together because they so wanted to memorialize their expertise and their phenomenal Herculean effort at orchestrating the work site, which was the, the, as, as great or greater an accomplishment, the speed of construction than the height of the Empire State Building um, and its overall size. So um, it, was, it was through the Starrett brothers in the 1920s um, that I traced back my interest and whatever research I could do into the earlier decades of um, building contractors. George Fuller, of course, is um, the name that, that most particularly comes to mind um, and has been the most studied. But in the generation even before that, as the, um, as the, the role of the general contractor actually becomes professionalized because it becomes so much more um, uh, coordinated, uh, right? And becomes a part of what I want to be, I hope the third part of our discussion, uh, industrialization of the building site and how squeezing labor out of the equation is the uh, motivation uh, in the modern skyscraper. This is one of the things that Tom talks about in the segment that we played for um, you and, as, and other people will find at the end of his talk on the material matters and something which um, has been a central point of Donald Friedman's uh, talk about the industrialization of the work site. So Joanna, long, my, I, I talked <laughs> far too long in setting you up, but uh, first talk about labor um, and yeah. laborers. Thanks. Um, maybe I can just make some overarching first before getting into any detail, but um, one of the things I think has, that has been missing from skyscraper history is the human side of technology, um, certainly since the, the modernist historians of the skyscraper um, were writing their works from the 20s through to the 50s, ending in Condit probably, um, there's been this huge valorization of technological change, almost as if it were um, uh, a self 
driven process um, and it just happens spontaneously. Um, I think architectural historians and um, historians of technology are more um, cognizant of telling the story now about the way in which technological change um, was accompanied by and enabled by a change in the way human labor is organized. Um, and this change in human labor organization didn't happen spontaneously and organically. It happened through a very complex set of negotiations between different um, actors, uh, not only architects, and contractors, building developers, uh, union representatives, uh, but others as well. Um, and you can say that public opinion also had uh, an impact on this reorganization. Um, where I'm going with this is, is to talk about the fact that uh, th this was a tremendous process of remaking the act of building. Uh, it, 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 uh, and it happened really in quite a, sh a short time period, which is quite astonishing, um, from a very craft-based artisanal series of building practices that had their origins, you know, centuries and centuries ago, to completely new ways of building. Um, and Tom and Don Friedman are much more uh, experts in, in that than I am. But what, what's interesting, I think, is that... Um, that this negotiation had to take place in order for uh, for the work to happen. And in the process of that negotiation, new ways of working evolved, including um, new professions like the contractor and um, the new systems of organization, you know, what we might call today project management, basically. This is the beginning of project management. You have spreadsheets to organize all of these people. You have time charts to look at um, the projection of each trade and how long it's going to take and how it interacts with others. Um, and when you look at the the skyscraper on the skyline, you know, the great iconic shots, it's it's easy to see them as expressions of technology, of materials, but it's less easy to see them as expressions of um, majestic project management. Um, and this is something that I think your book really helped us all to see, uh, Carol, the kind of economic factors that made these buildings possible. Um, Going to the second part of your question about the actual detail, um, if, if there's sort of one story to tell, I guess, and this is um, a story that Tom's told really well, it's the story of the of the diminishing of the power of the bricklayers. Um, this was an old, old trade that had incredible power up until the early to mid 1880s because they did the majority of work on any commercial building. And so they could leverage their power for better conditions, better wages, shorter working hours. Um, they became so powerful that they uh, created um, a situation where architects and building developers were trying out new technologies in order to um, evade their power to see how we can, you know, use different kinds of materials so that we don't have to deal with this very kind of obstreperous bunch. Um, and that's a story that, that Tom's told and that I told really quickly in my in my lecture. So, um, but I, it's not as linear as that and it's not as um, binary as that either. At the same time, new trades are, are coming up um, and they are finding their own ways to create um, leverage through um, unionizing, forming alliances across with other trades. Um, and that's that's the other story to tell, which is the creation of these industrial labor unions. So prior to this period, um, unions had been what is called craft unions, and they were very small, very particular to single trades. And in, in the US, at least, they were predominantly um, segregated by ethnicity. Um, so Irish, German, Scandinavians uh, would be involved in different trades, and that um, ethnic difference led at first to a sort of resistance to working together, but it was only when the sort of scale of building became apparent in this early 1880s period that, that they realized, okay, in order to, to make the most of the power that we have, 
we have to start working together. And larger industrial unions were formed that were sort of umbrella groups of the various um, trades. And the, the cause that they united around was the eight hour movement, the, the desire to limit the working day to eight hours, and then to a slightly lesser extent um, to stabilize hourly wages. Um, this is still in the sort of economic laissez-faire area where the, the economy of each city and the economy of the nation was incredibly volatile and unstable. So wages could vary dramatically from uh, year to year because of uh, booms and busts. So part of unionization was to stabilize the wages so that uh, workers could be guaranteed at least a certain level of income, even in uh, down times. And th there was um, success, obviously, in, in these activities. The, the legislation to limit the working day uh, was created. Um, unions were successful in getting collective bargaining and stabilizing their wages. Um, slightly later in the progressive era, they were successful in legislating for various health and safety legislations at the state level. Um, so that their workers would be protected. So this is all a kind of huge process of reorganization, not just of material, but of human bodies and human activists. Um, and that's, that's a very interesting story to tell, I think. So, so Tom, um, so Joanna has described how, sh how she modeled her, her kind of, you intellectual frame for this. Um, can, can you talk about your research and, and how you thought about it um, for your book? You've already mentioned from the architect's perspective, but um, maybe talking about where, um, wh what, are the, what are the sources? Um, how did you pursue your research? And then where did, where did that take you? Right. Well, that's, I, I, I like the word negotiate uh, very much because that is a recurring theme that um, new technologies spring up, and you know, in hindsight, you expect the you know curtain wall and steel frame to just instantly take over. Um, but then you find out that, you know, in fact, the that has to be negotiated with the city because there's no code that allows you know that kind of construction. The city is uh, you know enthralled not only to the developers, but also to the labor unions. And, you know, to the, to the immediate point about bricklayers, um, not only do architects and builders start to uh, develop the skeleton frame for many reasons, one of which is that it eliminates uh, the, the, the bricklayers from the site, but the bricklayers then seem to turn around and influence the city council to change the code in 1893 uh, to almost require uh, brick construction uh, in conjunction with steel. So there's this back and forth that um, in, in terms of sources, I find, I have found occasionally in professional journals, uh, but also in things like press accounts of city council meetings, in city archives, in you know, the minutes of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of public meetings. Um, there's a particularly great moment in the work I'm doing now, 1950s, where Chicago tries to change its code uh, to a, a, what we call a performance code, right? Getting rid of all of the requirements for individual materials. And there are long transcripts where um, the biggest controversy in the building code is gypsum drywall, which today is just the most ubiquitous taken for granted material on the planet. Um, but at the time, it actually pits uh, the union of plasterers who have had all of the work of finishing every residential and commercial building in the city against the carpenters who have this new material that they can literally nail up, you know, in a matter of, in a matter of minutes. And it's, it's the, the arguments back and forth, not even with the union, between the union and the city, but between two unions, where you start to realize that technologies, new types, you know, all, all these things only really emerge as they get worked out occasionally. And in this case, spoiler alert, there's a fist fight on the floor of City Hall uh, in Chicago over the, the use of gypsum drywall, which is just fantastic. Um, but, but you know, they, they, they literally, these developments literally get fought out. And 
it very often is a, a political thing. Building codes are political documents at the end of the day. And so that's that's been one source for me that I've gone back to again and again, just the very, very kind of boring pedestrian um, you know, minutes of city council meetings or press coverage of city council meetings where you realize that the, 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 the buildings that you see in say 1960 are in some ways designed in 1950 and 51 when the, the new code uh, is actually developed and not only kind of, um, uh, you know, we think of codes usually as limiting uh, possibilities but in this case, in a lot of cases, they're written very specifically to channel energies into other, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, materials or uh, or um, skilled labor that's been kind of sanctioned one way or another by the by the political force of that group in the in the in the city. Um, and I think there are there are untapped sources uh, for this as well. I think. You could probably uh, tell a very good skyscraper history if you went into, uh, you know, union records uh, from way back and looked, you know, as, as Joanna said about, you know, literally who were the people who, who built these and and, and what, how were they connected? I don't, I have, you know, taken a very glancing look at the the role of uh, unions and labor in skyscraper history. I think there's, you know, practically an infinite depth that, that one could go into if if you could find the right records. So Joanna, it, it, along the same lines, where did you find your richest sources um, for uh, for research, and and what what other questions are harder to get at? Um, what questions would you want to pursue uh, in further research, or would it, would advise maybe graduate students um, to look into uh, in avenues where there, there just hasn't been. Uh, enough work done is not necessarily because the sources don't exist, but we just haven't gotten around to thinking this way about it yet. Yeah, um, the, well, the origins of my work came through a pretty intensive um, reading of the Inland Architect and Builder, which was the professional magazine of the Chicago um, architects um, in the 1880s and 1890s and my the reason that I started at that point is um, uh, I guess when I was at graduate school in Princeton we were very invested in kind of unpacking modernist historiography um, which was um, driven by a sort of idea of technology as the driver and um, dominated by European voices in which um, the skyscraper was seen as a sort of spontaneous vernacular construction, almost authorless. Um, so my uh, my motivation for reading the Inland Architect um, was to see, okay, what were architects actually saying? What did they think they were doing? What were the debates they were having? And it was at that time, and this is in the 1990s, um, it was a sort of astonishing to me that the only voice we had really heard was Louis Sullivan through um, his very well-known articles, which were originally published in the Inland Architect, but they were the only ones that sort of made it through into architectural history by and large. Um, so when I read through uh, the Inland Architect, um, and I just want to be the cranky old professor here, um, I had to scroll through those things on the damn microfiche. Now you can just press a button and there they are. So anyway, all those contemporary graduate students, you don't know how lucky you are that you don't have to deal with microfiche. Anyway, reading through them, um, I got a totally different picture of what Chicago architects thought they were doing. And that was the basis of my book. And I augmented that with some reading um, from journal articles, uh, the mainstream press, the Chicago Tribune. Um, although, as we were saying just before this uh, session started, um, you have to be very careful when you read press articles because they generally are t slanted towards a particular political perspective. Um, so I tried to balance out my reading of the Tribune with reading um, of the radical papers, the alarm, to see what the, the radical um, activists were saying in opposition to what the Tribune was was publishing. Um, but I think that's this is a pretty well-established uh, research method now is to look through um, architectural journals. Certainly that's um, many dissertations have come out of that kind of work. Um, 
Don just raised a really interesting point in the chat, which was to say that uh, lawsuits are a really uh, rich source of information about building negotiations, legislations, disputes. Um, and they often have a lot of fine detail in them because the law rests on very fine detail. Um, so that, that's another interesting um, kind of avenue. And we uh, also, let me yeah. just interrupt for yeah. one second to say, and thanks to Google search and Google books, the, um, all you do is take a name and you get an enormous amount of returns and it's generally a lawsuit that has been found in the, in the search string. So um, not only is it a, a good way in order to, uh, to access uh, the arcana of, uh, that one could never find in the newspapers, uh, but it's enormously easy to find. So it's very mm -hmm. enriching. You can filter out um, and you can discover Go yeah, ahead. Absolutely. Um, but we were speculating that there must be um, the record books of contractors out there somewhere. Um, I don't know of any specifically. Tom probably has better information. But I think um, if one could find such a thing, and it potentially they don't, they exist, they've been preserved, I should say, in, in smaller cities. Um, and that's a, 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 another thing that I want to say is um, we're a little bit guilty of repeating this privileging of Chicago and New York. Obviously, these are not the only cities that tall buildings were built in. They were built in many, many cities and across the nation, and they have different configurations and different pressures on them. Um, so perhaps out there in, in another city, there are some great uh, contractors' record books that uh, a graduate student could um, make great use of. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, at the Skyscraper Museum, we have the job book of Paul Starrett that goes back to his, his years uh, with George Fuller when he represented the George A. Fuller Company in New York City. Um, they go back to about, um, off the top of my head, I think maybe 1904, something like that. But they're, they're simply compilations of the final pages of the cost of everything. Right, it's very unusual to get any kind of detail about, you know, as we had for the Empire State Building, as a as a kind of snapshot of the triumph of organizing this worksite. They just recounted every single trade and how many men were on the site that day, and they took pictures throughout. Um, these are on our website, uh, as well as in in the book, um, pictures of. The, the steam fitters on the 87th floor um, and, and all of the, of the building trades, but they were taking pictures of the work rather than the heroization of Lewis Hine, for example, of men at work in that, in that famous series that records uh, the workers on, at the Empire State Building, especially the iron workers. Um, so um, there, there is a kind of romanticization of the construction worker, especially iron workers, um, that has entered, principally through photography, uh, a, a kind of record of modernity, a record of labor history. I wonder um, if you both might talk about um, using photographs as, as sources um, or other, other kinds of documentation besides the written record or um, maybe an illustrated newspaper accounts. What other kinds of sources are there in order to get at these issues of labor and construction history? Tom, maybe? Yeah, sure. I, photography uh, for me was really important. Um, and, you know, the benefiting from photography sort of being, you know, almost for the first time being able to be used on job sites regularly in the 1880s and 1890s. So, um, you know, pictures of the Fisher Building under construction in particular, and, and a lot of people know that I have a, a thing for the Fisher Building in Chicago, but um, it's the, the, it was documented extensively uh, with photographs. And so there, for the first time, I think you can see this kind of new process of the steel frame going up. You can see the voids and the gray columns. The, the detail is just fine enough that you can identify what kind of columns they are. Um, and then interestingly, the cladding on the Fisher building, uh, starting on the second floor, right? So that they could drive trucks in and out of the first floor. And this uh, was a, it's a thing that you see in contemporary accounts a lot that, oh, you know, they started building the building in the sky, right? People didn't get that, that the columns were doing the work. They expected the, the heavy um, 
you know, heavy looking curtain walls uh, were doing the work. So there, there are documents like that. The, the, the photographs of the Fisher construction site are, are particularly uh, evocative, really, really useful. Um, and, and photography otherwise is a little scattershot. I mean, I very intentionally put a picture of two workers on the, on the cover of the, of the Chicago book, um, both as a kind of response to Lewis Hine. It's a, I think it's a Hedrick Blessing photo, but instead of these kind of heroic guys out on a, a, a steel girder, you know, it's just, it's like two guys eating lunch. And to me that, that captured a little bit of, you know, the kind of, um, yeah, a, a little bit of, uh, you know, how you actually get stuff built in Chicago sometimes. Um, to the, the most interesting documents, the ones that I found most useful in trying to understand the, the kind of fabric of the buildings were uh, both the, the drawings that the Chicago History Museum has. They have as complete uh, an archive from the Hollywood and Roche as, as anyone could ever want. Um, and then also going into uh, engineering journals and looking at detailed drawings. And, uh, you know, really the kind of most fun part of the project was sitting down with student teams who tried to, you know, digitally construct uh, the, the buildings, which gave us an understanding both of, um, you know, how the process would have to go, what crews would have to be on site when, but also how you get from, you know, individual parts that show up, you know, on site, you know, on a truck uh, and how those all get uh, merged together to form something that appears to be a, a uniform whole. Um, those drawings, of course, are, are rarer uh, even than the, the kind of documentation, the, the written documentation that often went along with it. But, um, you know, there's enough that, that we could get into a handful of examples and, and chart the, the way that the fabric of Chicago skyscrapers kind of evolved over, over these decades. Mm -hmm. Photographs are much more immediate, though, right? Much easier to sort of understand how they might be valuable right away. Yeah, I've often wondered why there isn't a monograph on um, Taylor, the great Chicago photographer, or maybe there isn't, maybe I'm remiss in seeing it. Um, because not, not yet. Not yet, not that's yet. a great topic. There's a huge amount of his work that's available. Um, and, uh, you know, Claire Zimmerman, who is there, is here, I think, has written some incredible um, scholarship on the role of photography in the creation of an idea of modern architecture. Um, but there's more, I think, written in the European context than in, than in the American one. And a, a book about Taylor could be so interesting because his shots of these famous buildings are so iconic. You know, they're reproduced over and over again, but there's a certain formula to them. They're always taken uh, with the corner leading the shot and they're taken from a certain um, point up in an adjacent building. So you can see the building as a kind of object. Um, and he probably does a lot of retouching that I'm not um, able to analyze because I'm not a historian of photography. Um, but I, just the, the, the importance of his work in the whole historiography of Chicago architecture almost can't be um, underestimated or overestimated. Um, so yeah, please, somebody write that book. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so because we only have about 10 minutes left, I, I don't want to give too short shrift to New York and to Union Square. So Joanne, I wonder, um, could you talk a, a little bit more about uh, the genesis of that book and the, the, the urban history lens as well as the, uh, the labor history lens? Um, that uh, locates in, in Union Square and how it moves out um, in your in your uh, you know academic thinking. Sure. Um, well, I could talk a, a lot about this because I just completed it. And um, but uh, very briefly, um, I wrote the book because I was teaching at Parsons School of Design, and a lot of my students would use Union Square as their example of public space, and they would build and test ideas and create designs based in Union Square. And there didn't seem to be um, a good history of it, um, apart from an interesting article by Rosalind Deutsch, the art historian. Um, talking about a very specific aspect of its gentrification in the 1980s. Um, so that that's what got the, the ball rolling on that book to talk about it as, as a kind of atypical but important example of 
at what Americans think public space is and what it has meant since the between the 1830s and the late 20th century. Um, but the reason I brought it into the talk for you, Carol, is that um, it is a kind of site um, in which labor history and the skyscraper come together in a fascinating way because there's so many examples of these interesting second and third generation loft buildings around it, starting with the Lincoln and the Spingler building from the 1880s going through to the Everett building um, and the Germania life on the other corner. So um, it was a center of labor protest, but also a place in which new forms of skyscrapers were proposed and experimented with, the, the loft building that Andrew Dolcart has spoken about um, so extensively and in such an interesting way. So I thought it might be a good, a good way to talk about the skyscraper in, a, in its larger urban extent, not just as an object, but as, a, as an urban entity that has a consequence on the environment in which it's sitting. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe we could all talk a little bit more about the identities of New York and Chicago as skyscraper cities. I mean, there really is no, no place other than Hong Kong, really, that is so quintessentially identified with uh, the high-rise building and, you know, indeed the skyscraper, uh, though from the perspective of the 21st century, looking back, this is, uh, the, has been the future of urban development um, in China, in the Mideast, uh, most anywhere, uh, in, certainly in Australia, not so much New Zealand, I guess, right, uh, Joanna, but, but uh, Australia is, has gone big for the tall building, especially in uh, Brisbane and, and Melbourne. So, um, so maybe talk a little, a little bit about urban history and urban, uh, urban identity. What can, what can you say? Is that too ambitious? Is it too romantic? Um, to to think about cities having this kind of image that is connected, uh, that is represented by its architecture. I know I, I tend to resist that uh, myself, but I wonder what your thoughts are. Well, I, Chicago has always seen itself as a skyscraper city, right? Whether you you know take seriously the idea that it's the birth of this skyscraper. It's certainly one of, always been one of the world centers, both for construction and, and also for, for sort of expertise. And there is, you know, still a, a very, very lively, uh, you might call it skyscraper culture here. We, we still build uh, interesting uh, tall towers. The economics behind them, sometimes I, I, I think they're probably not quite as uh, extreme as you know, proportionally as they must have been in the in the 1890s but i think there's almost a kind of expectation that 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 still goes on that's you know that's what happens uh, in downtown and you know also this is a, a, a city that continues to be a global center for that expertise and even though now uh you know a lot of the the, the tallest buildings are being built in the middle east and in, in um, south and east asia uh, a lot of those are still being designed in, in chicago uh, and I think that is uh, an interesting um, kind of manifestation or kind of um, tradition, you know, that 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 expertise is still here, uh, and even though the biggest ones maybe maybe get built built somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, and Chicago and New York, of course, and and you think of S O M um, with the yes. yeah. Chicago yeah. Chicago based uh, both architecture and engineering, um, but uh, also the world's tallest building builders uh, uh, include KPF uh, in, in New York, uh, Thornton Tomzetti as structural engineers, and they're, they're the ones who are always uh, the names that you see, whether it's the Mideast uh, uh, Ch um, China, uh, connected to the aspirational buildings that uh, breach 600 meters, 800 meters. Um, so, uh, Joanna, so is, is my question about um, trying as a historian to, uh, to divine, to summarize a city's identities um, through its buildings, is that uh, too, um, too broad and romantic a notion? Or is it something, is, you know, is it something that you feel um, that, that you have, that you tackle in the 
you know, the slice that you're taking through the history of labor and capital? I mean, I certainly think the role of the skyscraper in giving a city um, some kind of visual uh, and semiotic identity is is still a very current interest. I mean, you mentioned all of these cities in, in China and in Asia. Um, and, and what's interesting to me about that is that they, they sort of um, give the lie to the story that, again, that the modernist historians told, was, which was that the skyscraper was valuable as an economic entity. It was an efficient use of space. It was a good way to make profit. Um, your book and, and others have, have kind of um, told us that, that, yes, it was true in one way, but it was also not true in another way, um, that there were all these very well-known formulas about um, making efficient skyscrapers that were totally broken by important buildings like the Empire State, for example, that that, that was built for a totally different reason, not, not for profit or a different kind of profit. Um, and I think that's the case with these late 20th century, early 21st century skyscrapers, that their iconic, their iconic um, value is much greater than their, their economic value. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that, and it's very close to our, our closing time, um, but closing uh, uh, one subject in order to open a series of doors for a, a continuing discussion of, um, of future topics. So I'm going to thank uh, Joanna uh, Merwood Salisbury and Thomas Leslie for tonight and say, see you soon, um, because we will uh, certainly find much more to talk about in the future. So um, good night, everybody. Thanks for joining us.